My testimony is informed by my visit to Kiev two weeks ago as part of a small delegation of retired ambassadors and generals. We met with President Zelensky, senior government officials, and members of the RADA. The currently deployed Russian land and naval forces are like a boa constrictor around Ukraine, choking its economy and further threatening its sovereignty. If the Kremlin can bring about a collapse of the Ukrainian economy and government, it will not need to launch a new offensive or worry about sanctions. The Kremlin's aim is to make Ukraine a failed state, to force concessions and ensure Ukraine never becomes an integrated member of the West within the EU or NATO. The Kremlin believes they can achieve this by applying constant pressure on Ukraine's borders and isolating it from the Black Sea as they are doing now without actually launching a new offensive. Nonetheless, the Russian general staff has put in place everything needed to give President Putin multiple options, including launching a new offensive. Russian ships continue to arrive through the Turkish Straits into the Black Sea. The Kremlin has deployed more than 100,000 well-equipped troops near the Ukrainian border and in Belarus. Crimea remains home to 30,000 Russian troops and military capabilities and provides a massive bridgehead into Ukraine. Based on the current deployments and signals from the Kremlin, I believe that a new offensive within the next two weeks is possible, but unlikely. If there is a new offensive, I do not believe that it will be a massive assault on all fronts or a large-scale attack towards Kyiv. Such attacks are neither feasible nor necessary to achieve the Kremlin's aims. Any new offensive is more likely to be a continuation or expansion of the current conflict, particularly along the coast near Odessa and the Sea of Azov the same pattern Russia has employed since 2008 in Georgia. There are no real signs of de-escalation from the Kremlin, despite recent vague comments from Moscow about minor troop withdrawals. We will know more in the next few days. In a way, it feels like we are watching a slow motion train wreck happening before our eyes. And unless we can get the initiative, President Putin is driving that train. Belarus is a key part of the Russian scheme. Mr. Lukashenko could be gone by this summer. The Kremlin will send him into retirement and replace him with their own guy. We are seeing now the next phase of bringing Belarus formally and finally into the Union state with Russia. Nobody in Europe will shed a tear at Lukashenko's departure, and the world will naively sigh in relief that Russia did not attack Ukraine again. This has long-term implications for Putin remaining in power and could result in Russian troops being permanently stationed in Belarus next to the very vulnerable Suwalki Corridor. The administration and the Department of State deserve huge credit for the most comprehensive diplomatic effort I have seen since the 1995 Dayton Peace Accords. Every NATO country continues to reject the Kremlin's demands. We all recognize that this is about much more than Ukraine. Our alliance remains the bedrock of stability and security, but that security and our prosperity are endangered if Putin can expand his sphere of influence at will. And perhaps as important, a failure of deterrence in the Black Sea will send a signal of weakness to China. We should continue doing everything possible to enable Ukraine to defend itself on the scale of the Berlin LF. We should take the next steps required to deploy the NATO response force to the eastern flank for exercises to reduce the time required for employment. It's not escalation if you're already there. Thankfully, we still have our bases in Germany as our foundation in Europe for power projection, command and control, building readiness and presence. We would be in a very difficult situation now without the access and bases we have today in Germany. We need a strategy for the entire Black Sea region that uses all elements of US and allied power, including, including repairing the damaged relationship with Turkey. At present, because we do not have a healthy relationship with our Turkish ally, we are unable to use the single greatest element of leverage that we have, Turkey's sovereign control of the Straits, codified in the 1936 Montreux Convention, which would allow Ankara to close the Bosphorus and Dardanelle to Russian ships. The West should give President Putin the opportunity to draw back forces and reduce the chances of a conflict, but not at the cost of betraying Ukraine, our allies, or any of our values. Of course, we should still maintain dialogue with the Kremlin, but we must understand the nature of diplomacy with the Kremlin. They are not Boy Scouts. They use chemical weapons, poison, and murder against their own domestic opposition, and they use cyber and disinformation to destroy lives, societal structures, and trust in our democratic systems. We should talk, but we need to understand with whom we are talking. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions.